Hello and welcome to the Level 3 Award in Prescribing Nutrition for Physical Activity Revision webinar. Um, this webinar is aimed at those either completing the Level 3 uh, Nutrition Award as a standalone qualification, or it may also be embedded within those of you who are completing a Level 3 Personal Training qualification or the, also the Level 3 Exercise Referral qualification. The aim of the webinar is that you've already completed and gone through your manuals, so you've made revision notes, you've completed the e-learning activities, and then this should be the final stage in your revision prior to doing a knowledge checker and then attempting the mock exam before um, attending your workshop day or your exam assessment day. Uh, please note this is um, a recap webinar and you will still need to complete additional resources such as your manual and your e-learning content to make sure that you cover all the knowledge required uh, for the exam as well. So before we progress, we just need to recap what we mean by diet and nutrition. So the term nutrition is the delivery of essential materials which is required to promote optimal health and growth to cells and organisms. So, you know, it's, it's the food that we eat to make sure that our bodies can do what they need to do to be healthy and to deal with the, the stress and the situations we put on them. We give our body nutrition through our diet. So everybody has a diet. Um, quite often people perceive that you go on a diet, whether you're trying to eat more or eat less, lose weight, gain weight. But if you eat food, then you, know, you have a diet. It just depends on how aware you are um, of your diet on, in terms of how balanced that is. And a balanced diet is a dietary intake that provides adequate water intake as well as appropriate quantities of foods from all your food groups to fuel and support your lifestyle. Quite often there's then the discussion of which diet is best and the discussion to be had there really is uh, if you are thinking about your diet and you're thinking about what you are eating then chances are that is a good step towards your diet so you're not just aimlessly walking around buying and eating food as and when you need it but you're trying to plan your days you're trying to plan your weeks based on you know how busy you are and what you're doing so your diet is balanced um, the best advice would that you that you eat fresh and natural food as this will contain all of your macronutrients so your macros it will contain all of your micronutrients your micros and these micronutrients can include what you call phytochemicals vitamins and minerals so different diet approaches now there are many there's quite often what people call your splits so your macro splits where you're trying to give your um, intake a certain percentage whether they're from carbohydrates protein or fat so a very common and kind of a traditional approach would be that you have 50 percent of your ca of your calories from carbs 20 percent of your calories from protein and 30 percent of your calories from fat so a 50 20 30 split other common methods can be the paleo diet, so quite often uh, higher in protein and higher in fat and lower in carbohydrates and normally um, are very restricted on processed foods, which you know, isn't a bad thing. Uh, there can be a vegetarian diet and a vegan diet, which obviously aimed at not having animal sources or animal meats or maybe any food that comes from an animal, depending on whether you're vegetarian or vegan. Um, again, they can have their own challenges in terms of preparation, making sure you're eating quality food, and there's discussions to be had around whether you can get a full amino acid profile from plant-based foods, but that is not to be had now. Um, there's the 5-2 diet, so like all the different variations of fasting, um, and there's even things like meal replacement diets and the use of supplements and stuff. Now, every diet will be unique to every single person. Um, what works for that person, if they can maintain their body weight or lose weight or gain weight, you know, depending on what their goals are, if it works for them and they are healthy, then that is their diet and it's a good diet. If a paleo diet works for one person and a macro split diet works for another, or the, you know, the way that you approach your diet, then that's what you need to try and support clients with. What you might find is just because it works once for a client doesn't mean it'll work again. There is a moment of motivation and commitment and things that will change throughout a person's life and lifestyle that you might need to try different approaches at different times just to try and engage them and get them back on and being aware of their food. So there's lots of different variations, but throughout all of them, there are some underpinning um, musts and some underpinning do nots, and hopefully that's what we're going to cover. 
Just to touch on the meal replacement diet, obviously that is quite often using uh, supplements and it's just recommended that this sort of diet is more likely to contain high levels of processed food and few real foods and therefore potentially the quality of that food is debatable and also the longevity of behaviour change can be an issue as well in terms of are they actually learning new nutritional habits for, for food or are they caught in, a, in the middle ground of having to use supplements as well um, and generally we want to try and promote people to be eating food to begin with and supplements are to supplement that um, so the, just to be clear this is a level 3 award in nutrition it doesn't make you a dietitian uh, the term dietitian is legally protected and requires you to be qualified to degree level as a dietitian um, but the advice that you can give are government healthy eating guidelines um, such as what are given in public health which we will recap towards the end of this but hopefully as a personal trainer it's the ability to analyse a client's lifestyle pick up on the biggest areas that they need to improve on give the most appropriate advice, guidance and support um, and quite often that can make quite dramatic change in someone's behaviours, their nutrition and therefore you know, their training and their health um, however, with all of this, we, if we are collecting information about a client, we're doing this professional, so please be aware of things like data protection, uh, gathering informed consent, that you're allowed to gather this information and keep it for so long. And if you ever feel that you've come across a problem which um, is a concern or which you can't deal with, whether it's a safeguarding problem, a, a health problem, a, a, an eating disorder, anything like that, then obviously advise your client to contact their GP if you have concerns and don't try and deal with that situation yourself necessarily. Okay, so we mentioned macronutrients earlier. So the first thing we're gonna look at are macronutrients. Macro means big. So we generally need these nutrients in large amounts. Uh, we're talking grams rather micro or even smaller grams. Um, so macronutrients are, are food groups that we need in large proportions. First food group we're looking at are carbohydrates. So uh, carbohydrates are the main fuel source for the body. You know, your central nervous system runs on glucose. No matter what food you eat, your body will turn that into glucose if it needs to, so it can fuel your brain and fuel your, your nervous system. It's recommended, depending on your physical activity levels and lots of other factors, like your job, your lifestyle, and how hard you train, how often you train, what intensity you train, that your carbohydrate intake should be between 50 to 70% of your total calorie intake. Now, 50% I would recommend is a good starting point. If you start to go up to 60% or more, you are looking at a high carb diet. And if you start going up to 60 or even 70%, you would expect that individual to have quite a large uh, physically active job as well as very physically active training schedule. So I would say a good starting point is between maybe 50 and 55% of their recommended calories. Um, mentioned there, it's the only fuel the brain can use. And when we eat carbohydrates, no matter how we eat them really, whether we eat them as a plate of rice, a plate of pasta, a banana, um, you know, a bag of sweets, something like that, when that sugar goes into our body, that, that, that carbohydrate enters our system, we've got three options really. We either use it there and then, so hopefully it's needed and your body will start to burn that carbohydrate to fuel itself. But if it's not needed and it needs to store it, then it will store it as either glycogen in the liver and the muscle, or if those stores are full, then it could then store it as fat. And that's the potential um, issue if we have too many, not just carbohydrates, but calories or food full stop at once. And if we have too much food at one sitting, it replenishes all our needs and then we've got an excess or a surplus and it's a risk that our body will then store that calories those calories in those first food groups as fat as we we don't want to waste the food you know it's an essential thing we need to survive so your body instead chooses to store it as a fat but hopefully we either use the carbohydrate or we store it as glycogen which is an effective storing mechanism and for every gram of carbohydrate you eat there's four calories so if you were to eat a hundred grams of carbohydrates there's 400 calories in that Carbohydrates can have different names. So you have what first of all you call monosaccharides. So the word mono means one, and saccharide is the sugar. So saccharide is one. 
They're generally called simple sugars as because they can be man-made, they are found in confectionery, so they're found in cakes, sweets, pops, um, but you can also find them in fruit and other foods as well, fruit and vegetables. So um, because they are generally found in man-made foods, they're sometimes known as bad sugars or bad carbohydrates. You can also then create combinations. So you can add glucose and fructose, which makes um, a sugar called sucrose. You can add glucose and galactose, which makes a sugar called lactose, which is often associated with milk. And then, strangely enough, if you add glucose to glucose, you don't get glucose, you get maltose, also known as maltodextrin. Um, again, some of those can be naturally occurring, some of them can be man-made. And as I said earlier, they are associated with being bad carbs because of their effect on blood sugar levels and being bereft or empty in vitamins and minerals. So quite often, you know, all you're getting is the calorie from that carbohydrate, the four calories per gram, and there's no additional health benefits in terms of vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, anything like that. Um, so firstly, we can find these in natural sources. So things like fruit and vegetables, you know, will have glucose and fructose in them. They are a very good source of carbohydrates they're full of vitamins they're full of minerals they're full of fiber um, we'll touch on them later when we look at fiber as well um, but equally these sort of sugars can be found in your sweets your chocolate bars your crisps your fizzy pops and when they're found in those sort of foods they will empt uh, empty your system very quickly you know you could swill a sugary drink around your mouth and spit it out again and some of that sugar will be empty uh, entering your bloodstream and causing your blood sugar to spike that's how simple those sugars are whereas when you get those sugars in a piece of fruit or a vegetable you have to eat the fruit you have to break it down in your stomach it will slowly digest that and therefore it enters your bloodstream a lot slower so it does depend where you get these sort of carbohydrates from after the mono and the disaccharides you can then have polysaccharides so poly means many so this is where the um, molecules of sugar have lots of chains and it takes a lot longer for these sorts of carbohydrates to be broken down and absorbed. Uh, people often call these as complex carbs because of that, because they're, they're, they're complex in structure and it takes a long time to break them down. And people often call them good carbs um, because of this complex structure. They will take a long time to break down in your stomach. Uh, they'll keep you fuller for longer and they will kind of drip feed into your bloodstream hopefully meaning that it keeps your blood sugar levels stable and they don't cause a spike. Um, now, I'd be careful of using the term good and bad, really. You know, um, try and give them different terminologies, whether they're complex or simple or you know, even processed or unprocessed, something like that, because you don't want people to be start um, judging themselves if they're having a bad carb as such. It's, it's just understanding the impact that it could have and making sure they don't do it too often, really. Uh, these complex carbohydrates are often associated with high levels of fiber and a good vitamin and mineral content. And when we talk about fiber, another name for fiber is a non-starch polysaccharide. So fiber is a very, very complex carbohydrate and it is so complex that we can't derive energy from it, which is why we call it a non-starch polysaccharide. So it's a polysaccharide, which means it's it, there's many molecules of carbohydrates being bound together, but we can't get energy from it. So it's rather than being a starch base, it's non-starch. We can't actually break it down to, to get that starch out of it. Um, imagine a branch on a tree or a twig. You know, that twig is so fibrous and it's made up of so, such strong and fibrous material that we don't have the digestive system to break it down. Um, a good example of what we do eat would be sweet corn. So you know, when you eat sweet corn, your digestive system can't necessarily break it down. And when you go to the toilet, you can obviously see sweet corn again because your body hasn't been able to break down the skin of that kernel, that, um, that piece of corn. But fiber is very good for us. We can have what you call soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber is normally the inside of the plant, the inside of the fruit, the inside of the vegetable. Well, that is easily broken down and soluble. Um, there's benefits of that as well as insoluble fiber, which is like the skin of the fruit and veg, which we can't break down, such as the skin of the, the sweet corn again. 
and they're both are beneficial um, to our digestive systems as well as our gut bacteria, making us keep full, uh, cleaning out your digestive system and your bowels. So we want to try and promote these sort of complex, uh, long chain fibrous foods, often known as you know whole meal, um, natural, organic foods and stuff like that. So carbohydrates are linked to the glycemic index or the GI. The glycemic index um, is a measure of the effects of carbohydrates on blood sugar levels. So it's how quickly carbohydrates are broken down and how quickly they enter our bloodstream. If they enter our bloodstream quickly, they have a high GI. If they enter our bloodstream slowly, they have a low GI. So generally to try and control our blood sugar levels so we don't have a sugar spike, which might promote weight gain, or we don't have a, you know, a sugar drop, so we start getting a bit uh, angry and a bit moody and you know, uh, craving sugary foods. We want to try and eat um, foods, not necessarily that are low, just a combination of them really. You, know, you can have low carbohydrates, which are quite often vegetables. You can have medium, which is um, a combination of fruit and vegetables. Or you can also have high, which again, could be a combination of fruit and vegetables, but it can also be like rice and bread, potatoes and stuff like that. And you want to try and a nice combination of them throughout the day. Um, a good example of how the glycemic index works is that if you were to um, pick a banana, for example, when you first pick the banana, that banana's green, it's very, very fibrous. If you were to eat a green banana, um, it probably won't be very nice and it might even make you poorly. It'll be that fibrous. However, once you pick it, an enzyme starts to break that structure down and the banana goes from green to yellow. So when it's yellow, you can start to eat it but those enzymes continue to break it down and eventually that yellow banana turns into a brown banana. And if you think about what happens to the taste, it gets sweeter and sweeter. So that banana is almost breaking itself down from a complex polysaccharide, which is a green banana, into a polysaccharide, which we can eat, and then into a monosaccharide, which is a lot um, sweeter. So by breaking it down, it will make the banana sweeter, it will make the banana easy to digest, and it will speed up the glycemic index. So potentially if you have a yellow banana, that will enter your system slower than if you were to eat a brown banana. Now, how much of an impact that has on a person's diet and lifestyle and weight gain and weight loss is debatable. It's only one banana, but it's just to understand the process of what the glycemic index is, um, not necessarily that you should not eat brown bananas. And blood sugar levels are linked to glucagon and insulin. So uh, we'll talk about insulin first, actually. So no matter what food you eat, um, whether it's a carbohydrate, a protein, or a fat, your body will release insulin. Um, carbohydrates are most commonly associated with insulin because they will generally have the biggest response. You know, if you were to drink or eat 30 grams of carbs, 30 grams of protein, or 30 grams of fat, it will be the carbohydrates that will trigger the, the quicker and the higher insulin response. However, protein and fat will still trigger a response. Um, and we need insulin to allow us to store glucose as glycogen in our liver or muscle. So insulin is not a bad hormone. It is essential. We need it. It's when you eat a banana, when you eat a plate of rice, when you have a potato, a portion of chips, no, no matter what you eat, when, you, when your body starts to break that food down, it will enter your bloodstream into glucose. If your body doesn't need it there and then, it will want to store it as glycogen in your liver and muscle. To open those doors of the liver and the muscle, it will produce insulin, and it will then turn that glucose into glycogen and, and store it in your muscle and your liver. Um, a way to remember that is that when food goes in, you will produce insulin. Um, so on this example, if your blood sugars get too high, you will start to produce insulin. Whereas also on the flip side, if you don't have something to eat for quite a long time, whether it's three hours, four hours, or you might start to exercise and your blood sugar levels start to drop, you'll do the opposite. You'll produce a hormone called glucagon. And glucagon turns your glycogen back into glucose and puts it back into the bloodstream so your body can then use it. So you've kind of got a natural saving mechanism and when you're starting to run out of it, you've got a natural way of breaking your stores back down 
um, and th these are the two hormones that you use you have insulin or glucagon and again a good way to remember it is that when food goes in you produce insulin and when all your glucose has gone you produce glucagon neither hormone is uh, good or bad they're, no, they're both essential it's just if we produce if we have regular sugar spikes we're, we're eating a lot of calories and a lot of processed carbohydrates and fats and proteins then we're going to promote um, a lot of insulin and that insulin will, will promote storage and if our glycogen stores are full it's going to result in fat storage so that's a bit on carbohydrates, just the technical names, how it links to glycemic index and the hormones used around there, so insulin and glucagon. The next macronutrient we're going to look at is protein. So protein is most commonly associated with building and repair, so things like your skin, your hair, your bones, your muscles. However, nearly every single chemical reaction in your body will require a protein, a, 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 an amino acid. So yes, in the first column, they are essential for structure in terms of muscle, bone, tissue, but they are, you also have what you call homeostatic enzymes. So we just spoke there about insulin helping you store glucose as glycogen. The way insulin does that is by using an amino acid. Um, for you to break down food in your stomach and in your saliva, it requires an amino acid, which is an for you to transport oxygen around your body, it's an amino acid. So amino acids are used in every single chemical reaction in your body and it's really that that your body really needs them for as well as you know to replenish after exercise and make sure you can maintain or build muscle mass and then finally the last column is um, it can be useful generally um, if you are using protein as a fuel you are very um, depleted in glycogen and glucose and you are probably in a fasted state or you've been doing a very long um, period of exercise and it's preferably really wants wants to be avoided it, you know there are risks associated with that but if needed your body will start to burn down uh, or turn protein into glucose what you call um, gluco uh, gluconeogenesis um, you don't necessarily need to know that but just so you know it's called gluconeogenesis where your body will turn protein into glucose so you can continue to to function because you need glucose however um, I would suggest you try to avoid it it's recommended that we have around 10 to 20 percent of our calories from protein number between 0.8 and 2 grams for every kilogram of body weight that you weigh um, in particular it's recommended that you don't go over the 2 gram for every kilogram you weigh as there could be links to it um, damaging your kidneys and your liver if your body's having to process and filter too much of these foods but very similar to carbohydrates there is four calories per gram so like we said there's four proteins per gram 10 to 20 percent of your calorie intake um, 0 0.8 to 2 grams for every kilogram that you weigh and the range from that just so you can see there is um you know if you're a sedentary adult, you're not doing much training, you're just kind of wanting to maintain what you are and who you are, then you can eat 0.8. If you are starting to do exercise, it's recommended you eat between 0.8 to 1.5. Uh, there's then more specific ones, depending on if you're wanting to build muscle or you're involved in cardiovascular training. And a good one is for the growing teenage athlete because their bodies are growing regardless, so they will need good supply of energy and a good supply of proteins and fats. But if you're asking them to train as well and exercise on top of that, then their muscles and their bones are going to want to get bigger and stronger as well as their bodies naturally, so they do need a good supply. And it is recommended that no one goes over two grams for every kilogram that they weigh. The, technica, te the technical name for a protein is a peptide or an amino acid. So just like you can have a saccharide for a sugar, you can have a peptide for a protein. And you can have these different combinations, just it's very similar to the carbs. So you can have a dipeptide, which means two, a tripeptide, which is three. You can have an oligopeptide, which is between four and nine. And then you can have a polypeptide, which is 10 or more. Now, we don't need to worry too much about these, but what's important to understand is just the combination of these amino acids, almost like your DNA, will dictate what their purpose is and function is within the body. Because we only actually have 20 amino acids. So but the, com the, 
the variations of combinations of which those amino acids could be structured um, is pretty much endless. So uh, depending on their structure and their sequence will kind of dictate what their purpose is within the body. And there's 20 amino acids. And there's nine, which we call essential amino acids, which are EAAs, and 11 are non-essential. And then you can also have something called conditional essential. So first of all, what we mean by essential amino acids, these are amino acids that we cannot synthesize. We cannot make them in the body, so we need to eat them. Um, in theory, if we do eat these nine essential amino acids, then we can create the other 11 non-essential so it's important that we eat these nine essential amino acids because one we can make them but by eating these we can also make the other 11. Conditional essential um, is when um, someone may be in a certain part of their life so they could be if you're very young so you know, like a child or a baby um, if you are a pregnant female or if you are um, quite elderly as well, there may be certain amino acids that are essential to you at that point in your life, but not necessarily in everyday life for um, the general adult. So they can be quite unique situations. So we really want to try and make sure people get these essential amino acids. And the recommendations are that we get them from fish, any type of fish, tuna, mackerel, cod, anything like that, meats, so chicken, pork, beef, lamb, uh, poultry, which is obviously chicken, um, eggs, dairy produce, it can be milk, cheese, yogurts, um, peanuts can be a good source of essential amino acids. Um, but a downside to a lot of these foods are they are animal based. So if someone for religious or cultural beliefs doesn't want to eat animals or eat foods that come from animal sources, like a vegetarian or a vegan, um, we do need to be aware of how we can promote good essential amino acid intake that are not from animal sources and it can be from soy based foods um, such as tofu and soybeans and soy milk and things like that um, however to assist these we can also be aware of what we call complete uh, sorry not complete but complementary proteins so what I've just touched on there is foods that contain all nine essential amino acids are complete proteins. Um, a food that contains, that doesn't contain all nine is what you call an incomplete protein. So for example, if you were to, um, well, sorry, um, so an example would be you can eat two types of food that may be an incomplete protein. Let's say a, a tin of beans might only have an essential amino acid one to four in it however if you also have some bread or toast the toast could have amino acids five to nine so together those two food groups complement each other so they're classed as complementary proteins because together you will get a full range of your essential amino acids and there are some common food groups such as beans on toast would give you a full spectrum of your essential amino acids and rice and peas would give you as well. So these food groups are obviously quite common in certain cultures. Um, whether that's come around naturally or through people knowing is something to discuss, but um, as a personal trainer, someone who might be giving people nutrition advice and people who choose to be vegetarian or vegan or might not like meat and want to eat, you know, might not like the texture or the taste of meat and fish and stuff like that, you do need to be aware of how you can recommend a good spectrum of rice and pulses vegetables and seeds, nuts and vegetables, and grains and pulses, which you know, are not bad foods to eat anyway. So maybe we should be recommending that to um, meat eaters as well as people who are vegetarian and vegan anyway, just to promote good health and good nutrition. Okay, and the last macronutrient is our fats. Um, it's recommended that around 25 to 35% of your calorie intake comes from fat. So we're looking at now around 50% from your carbs, about 20% from your protein, and 30% from your fat. We need fat as it's used for energy. You know, you're working aerobically now while you're listening to this webinar. You'll be breathing in oxygen. You'll be using that oxygen to create energy. And as part of that process, we need to use fat as a fuel to create that energy. Uh, we need fat for insulation to keep us warm. We need it to protect our vital organs. We need it to transport and store fat soluble vitamins which is something we're going to look at shortly 
and we also need fat to cover our nerve linings um, and there's lots of other benefits about eating fats in terms of mental health and, and brain health and heart health as well. Um, another name for the basic form of fat in your body is a triglyceride. This is essentially um, what you call free fatty acids. So a triglyceride, free fatty acids on a glycerol backbone and it's the basic form of fat in our body. And what's different with fat is it is nine calories per gram rather than four calories per gram. So there's quite a lot more calories per gram in fat than there is in carbs or protein, um, which is why quite often if someone's trying to lose weight, um, the first recommendation straight away is to try and decrease your fat intake. As if you decrease your fat intake by 10 grams, that's nearly 100 calories. Whereas if you decrease your protein or your carb intake by 10 grams, it's only 40. So straight away, if we're looking to create a calorie deficit, quite often it's recommended to decrease fat intake because it's, um, it's a bigger win straight away to try and decrease your calories. However, people then do associate fat as being bad for you and that fat will make you fat, etc. However, not necessarily true. It's essential. We need it for all those things that we've just mentioned. And it's just a matter of trying to control your calorie intake really. So the different types of fats, you can have what you call saturated fats. These fats are normally called bad fats because they're found in takeaway foods and processed foods, you name it. If you, if you buy a sandwich from a petrol station or a supermarket, you buy pork pie, a pasty, a Mars bar, a pack of crisps, um, you go to the sandwich shop, you, you're buying a, a fry up, a takeaway, an evening meal, chances are those foods will be quite high in saturated fats um, however saturated fats are not bad for you we do need a certain amount it's recommended that between 10 and 25 percent of our fat intake should be saturated fat so about 25 to 30 percent of our calories should come from fat and of that fat 25 percent of it should be from saturated food um, the thing that makes saturated fat saturated fat is its chemical makeup it's called what you've got a single bond um, essentially that means that at room temperature it is normally a solid so if you think of um, if you ever cooked bacon and the fat comes out of the bacon once that bacon cools down it turns into a solid where if you think of um, olive oil at room temperature it is more of a liquid than a solid so that's what normally gives it away that it's saturated fat that it's a solid at room temperature um, and good sources of this sort of fat would be meats, eggs, dairy products, palm oil, coconut oils. And that is where we would prefer our clients to get saturated fat from, not processed foods from takeaways and supermarkets and shops. Um, however, what you'll find is you often find a good source of saturated fat with a good source of essential amino acids. So in terms of meats, eggs, dairy products, there where you would also find your nine essential amino acids. So it can go hand in hand sometimes where if you're eating a good protein, you'll also be eating some good fats. The other types of fats are what people call unsaturated fats. These fats are normally called good fats um, and they can be categorized into what you call mono unsaturated fats. So mono means one. And it means there's one double bond. Again, I wouldn't get too concerned about that. It's just the chemical structure in the body. It means that there's one double bond. And these monounsaturated fats are linked to lowering levels of cholesterol, lowering your levels of triglyceride, and therefore decreasing your risk of coronary heart disease. And you can get your monounsaturated fats from olive oil, rapeseed oil, avocados, nuts and seeds. So any sorts of nuts and seeds, whether they're Brazil nuts, walnuts, you know, pumpkin seeds you can throw into a salad, even sesame seeds you can throw into a stir fry, things like that. It can be useful to throw these sort of foods into salads and, and meals, even though they might not have much impact on the taste or anything like that, but you know, there's a benefit in eating them. Uh, the other sort of unsaturated fat are polyunsaturated. So poly means many, and it means there's many double bonds. Again, I won't worry too much about the structure, but in particular, your polyunsaturated fats can be broken into your essential fatty acids, which are your omega-3 and your omega-6. Now these essential fatty acids have been associated with very good health benefits. So um, you can get your omega-3 from oily fish, such as mackerel, 
uh, from walnuts, from eggs, from cod liver oil, and you can also get omega-6 from sunflower seeds, sunflower oils, pumpkin and sesame seeds. Supposedly omega-3 has stronger links to health with some omega-6 being included in processed foods and potentially leading to ill health. So what to take from that really is um, man food manufacturers who are aware that people are becoming more health conscious and they're trying to buy the right sorts of food in processed food, in packaged food. They know that you might be looking for saturated fat because it's often being said that it's bad for you. So they will decrease their saturated fat in taking a food but we'll probably fill it up with vegetable fats and therefore it's not labeled as a saturated fat, it's labeled as a sunflower oil. A sunflower oil. Um, so quite often foods that we eat could be quite high in omega-6 without us knowing and we are generally quite low in omega-3. Um, so just be aware of that on food and packaging and now obviously food companies are there to try and sell products to us and they're trying to get around our health concerns by, put, by decreasing saturated fat but putting alternatives in there, such as vegetable oil. But these essential fatty acids have been linked to lots of health benefits, such as brain and eye development. Um, it prevents cardiovascular disease, can help to prevent Alzheimer's, will reduce cholesterol and triglyceride levels, can enhance the elasticity of blood vessels, and can prevent the build up of harmful fat deposits in the arteries. So sorts of foods that we, we want to try and promote. Linking with fats is cholesterol. So, first of all, we need cholesterol. It's, again, cholesterol isn't bad for us. We need cholesterol as it gives our cells structure. If you think of every single cell in your body, think of it as a paddling pool. We need to blow up the sides of our paddling pool so we can put water in that paddling pool. Um, cholesterol gives our cells that structure. It blows up the sides of our cells so we can then fill that cell with a little nucleus and a little bit of plasma and then you know whatever the purpose of that cell is it can function we need cholesterol to create hormones and we need cholesterol to um, trigger enzymes in our system so we can have everything from digesting food to your central nervous system we need however cholesterol oh sorry start again the, what we use cholesterol for is to is to i'll start that again sorry we need to transport cholesterol around our body but cholesterol is a lipid and your bloodstream is 99% water and if you're if um, fat and water don't mix so if this cholesterol tries to use your bloodstream as a way of traveling around the body they don't mix so what we need is a system of transporting this cholesterol and your fat around your body in the bloodstream and what we use are lipoproteins so to begin with we have what you call VLDLs very low density lipoproteins these very low density lipoproteins um, there's just a note there that that is another use of an amino acid because it's a protein so it's a way of your body again it's um, another use of an amino acid within your body but these very low density lipoproteins will get loaded up with cholesterol and triglyceride and will travel around the body dropping them off where they're needed so dropping them off at the cells and stuff now that's a fantastic function in your body but once the triglycerides have been deposited the VLDLs turn into LDLs and they're called low density lipoproteins um, and they're then carrying mainly cholesterol and those low density lipoproteins will start to hang around in your blood, bloodstream they, they, they've lost, lost their purpose now their function and if they're not taken back to the liver to be resynthesized, then they can start blocking up your bloodstream. They'll start uh, laying plaque down on your arteries. And that's when you can start to um, develop um, bad cholesterol or high cholesterol, and it can start to lead to cardiovascular diseases. So we need a system of returning the LDLs, the low density lipoproteins, back to our liver so we can reload them with what they need, either cholesterol or triglycerides and they can continue on their way. And the way we do that are with high density lipoproteins. So these HDLs almost pick up the LDLs, take them back to the liver so they can be reloaded and then they can become useful again. So that's a bit of a sequence of events. You know, they're loaded at the beginning called VLDLs. 
Once they've gone around the body and they've dropped off what they need to, they turn into LDLs, but those LDLs then become useless. If they hang around in our bloodstream for too long, they can become a detriment. So we need to take them back to the liver using our HDLs, our high density lipoproteins, so they can be reloaded and they turn back into VLDLs. Okay. So again, cholesterol often said is bad for you and you want to avoid it, but it is essential. We just need to avoid foods, um, in particular that are high in processed saturated fats. So again, it comes from processed fats, as this could have a detriment on our blood uh, profile. If we're looking at cholesterol um, and you've got a client, it is recommended that their cholesterol should be below 5.2. Um, that might be five now, depending on what you read, but around 5.2 or five, it should be below. And it's recommended that you should have a ratio of almost one to one. So if your LDL is 2.5, then your HDL could be 2.5, and that'd be a really good ratio, rather than kind of LDL being four and your HDL being one. You can increase your HDLs by exercise. So you know, just exercising alone can increase your HDLs, which will decrease your LDLs. Um, you can also increase your HDLs by eating fruit and veg, eating whole grain foods, and eating omega rich foods as well. HDLs will in turn decrease your LDLs and will most probably decrease your calorie intake as well. Because if you start eating lots of fruit and veg and whole grain rich foods, um, chances are you've got to be eating good unprocessed foods and therefore you'll probably be eating less calories and you'll probably um, lose weight which can also be a big factor on your cholesterol okay so we've looked at macronutrients there carbohydrates proteins and fats which we need in relatively large amounts because we need them in grams when we look at vitamins minerals and phytochemicals they are what you call micronutrients we need them in relatively small micro or even smaller grams milligrams micrograms um, and generally wherever you find vitamins and minerals you will find phytochemicals um, if your spectrum of macronutrient intake is wide and varied then the sources or types of micronutrients should be sufficient so as long as you're eating good sources of carbohydrates good proteins good fats and they're from natural sources hopefully um, your micronutrients will just look after themselves. You're going to get them all anyway from the whole foods that you're eating. Um, they are found in high amounts in fruit, vegetables, seeds, nuts, lentils, fish, certain meats, dairy and eggs. So they're the food groups that we've mainly been talking about anyway. So it just shows how they're all linked. And they are essential for bodily growth. So these vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals will promote enzymes which provide the lock and key for all chemical reactions inside our human body. Um, also known as homeostasis. And there's six vitamins that you need to be aware of. There are a four that are fat soluble called your ADEC, your vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E and vitamin K. So ADEC are your fat soluble and your water soluble are B and C. Now what this means is that your body will store and transport these vitamins in either fat or water. If your body transports them and stores them in water, you'll generally need those vitamins every day on a daily basis because we use a lot of water, we, we breathe water, we urinate water, we drink a lot of water, and therefore vitamin B and C can be ran down quite quickly. So we normally need quite high amounts of vitamin B and C on a daily basis. Whereas vitamins A, D, E and K are stored in fat, which means they're quite often stored in the liver or our major organs. And you do need to be careful there that you don't have an excessive amount of fat soluble vitamins as it could lead to some sort of overdosing or some sort of um, damage to your vital organs potentially. And each vitamin has a different purpose really, even though they are quite interlinked. So vitamin A can promote your gastric juices, so breaking down food, uh, bone building, rich blood, uh, rich blood. Vitamin D is very strongly linked to um, your bone health. So without vitamin D, you can't absorb calcium. So it's really important for your bone health and your teeth. Vitamin E is classed as a natural antioxidant and quite often you find it in things like skincare products because they're trying to promote an, actually an antioxidant effect on the skin. But obviously that can affect internally as well when you eat vitamin E. 
Uh, vitamin K is linked to blood clotting, which again is a, a benefit. You know, it sounds a negative, but if you cut yourself, you don't want to continually bleed. So your body has vitamin K to try and prevent that. And then vitamin B and C. Uh, again, vitamin B is essential for carbohydrate um, intake. Without vitamin B, you can't absorb, store, and utilize carbohydrates effectively. So vitamin B is very important. And vitamin C as well is often known as a good antioxidant. Um, often found in like your, your lemsips and, and things like that when you're not feeling very well. And is essential for growth, repair, and um, as an antioxidant, as I said. So hopefully um, an overview of vitamins and minerals and what we need them for and the different types. And some minerals as well. So you can have calcium, chloride, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, sulfur. There are hundreds and hundreds of minerals. Um, calcium in particular is quite important, we've said, for our bones and our teeth. Magnesium is quite important for muscular contractions and hormone productions. Sodium and potassium are linked quite often to things like cramp and good fluid uh, balance to make sure that our fluid pumps can work. But there are um, a lot of minerals in the body and hopefully there's just um, a list of some few, some of, some of the key ones. So that's an overview of food intake that you can eat. We've got macronutrients and micronutrients. Macronutrients are carbs, proteins and fats. Micronutrients are vitamins, minerals and phytochemicals. And it's important for us to know this. However, quite often we need to give our clients quite simple advice. We don't need to bamboozle them with all the technical names. So quite often we're going to follow the national guidelines given by the public health or even by the Food Standards Agency. And one of them is the Eat Well Guide. So here you can see on the left, it's promoting lots of fruit and veg intake on the left. Um, it's promoting some complex carbohydrates on the right. It's promoting uh, protein intake, whether it's beans, pulses, fish, eggs and meats. And it's also promoting um, some dairy intake as well. So one, you can show your client this and say, you know, in terms of portion control or what's on your plate, are you eating the right types of food in the right types of amounts? Uh, they give a little bit for oils and spreads in terms of what like, to cook with and to put on any of your foods. And what they've now done is they've taken off the sweet and sugary stuff. So if you look at the bottom left, they've put that to the side to say, you know, eat this as often, as less often as you can. You know, this shouldn't be part of your diet whereas previously that was involved or included in the Eat Well plate. And then at the top right, they're trying to promote good water intake. Um, there's pros and cons to something like that. Um, an advantage is it gets someone to think about their diet. So we said at the beginning, as long as someone's actively thinking about the food that they're eating and things like that, hopefully it's going to promote them to have a good diet. Uh, the recommendations in that food plate is that is um, hopefully promoting a reduction in processed food and encourages the consumption of fruit and vegetables it encourages portion control uh, it encourages whole food consumption um, and it encourages moderate alcohol intake if anything it doesn't even mention alcohol intake so um, you know, it's not necessarily saying that you sh should drink X amount of units a week it's saying you know it's not even mentioning it a potential limitation to all of this, though, is it's aimed at populations, not individuals. So if you've got an eight, uh, a 40-year-old male or female who weighs 80 kilograms, they are not the same person as the next person. And depending on their activity, their physical activity levels, their job, their, their personal preferences, everyone does need bespoke nutritional guidance and advice. Um, it assumes a one-size-fits-all approach. It is criticised for being shaped by food agencies and politics in terms of promoting foods that they make, such as pasta and cereals, and you know, uh, rather than just fruit and veg that potentially you know, people can grow and you can uh, buy a little bit easier. And it doesn't necessarily give enough advice on exactly how much, how many calories and what portion you should eat. Um, so some guidance you could give to clients, um, base your meals on starchy foods, eat lots of fruit and vegetables, at least five portions a day. Now, um, the guidance is five portions as a total, so it might be three portions of veg and two portions of fruit, because that's realistic. Ideally, really, we'd want people to be eating five portions of fruit and five portions of veg, but that's an unrealistic goal to begin with. So just five a day of fruit and veg, and then try and build on that. Um, eat more fish. 
try and have two portions of fish a week uh, one that's oily one that isn't cut down on saturated fine sugar try to eat less salt so no more than six grams a day get active and try to be a healthy weight so using the bmi scale drink plenty of water and don't skip breakfast um, breakfast remember is when you break the fast um, it's often recommended that you have it immediately when you wake up not everyone can do that but i would say it's important that when somebody does break the fast that they do it using an appropriate well-balanced meal so um, and that they don't get too hungry so it is normally recommended within an hour um, you might go two hours but the main thing is that they don't get too hungry and that when they do break the fast it's a it's a balanced meal nothing too sugary nothing too calorific nothing too fatty anything like that um, it's recommended that the average male has about two and a half thousand calories um, the average female has around 2,000 and 50% of those calories should come from carbs no more than 35% should come from fats so between 25 and 35 for fats and everybody should have at least 55 grams of protein a day uh, which is around 9 or 12% you can go up to 20% really as long as you don't go above the 2 gram for every kilogram that somebody weighs looking at portion size um, there it's just to give you an idea that you know portion size is uh, two satsumas or two plums two kiwis if you're looking at vegetables it's two broccoli spears four tablespoons of kale spinach or green beans two, three sticks of celery if you're looking at bread rice or pasta it's one slice of bread it's a handful so their hand is quite a useful um, in ratio to their body and therefore can give them a good portion control if you're looking at meats and fish it could be the size of a deck of cards um, a, a fish should be the size of a checkbook you don't see many checkbooks around then <laughs> anymore but um, hopefully people know what a checkbook is um, and again it's promoted at the bottom that foods and drinks high in fat or sugar should be limited okay and then the last little bit is um, just some food labels so according to the food standards agency when you're looking at this food that's in the supermarket it's in a shop by law these foods have got to have ingredients listed and they've got to have them listed in weight order so straight away if you go to um, the ingredients of a product and the first thing you see is um, flour or corn flour or high fructose corn syrup or something like that then straight away it gives an indication that that is that is the that is what the most product is in that food it's listed in weight order so whatever the first couple of ingredients are in that ingredients list is what is most in that product um, obviously if you get to it and it mainly says tomatoes onions and celery then that bodes well it looks like it's quite a good product if it says lots of uh, processed carbs and sugar names or even technical chemical names that you don't know then that's normally a concern uh, food products have also got to list macronutrient calorie values per 100 grams. However, they will often give you that macronutrient calorie in portion as well. So quite often you get two columns. Um, how many grams in, of protein, carbs and fats are in this product per 100 grams, but how many are in this product per portion? And the reason they give you it per portion is so you can see roughly how much you're eating from that portion. However, be aware companies will sometimes reduce their portion size to make the product look healthier such as you know having 35 grams of cornflakes which the average person has 100 grams of cornflakes so on the side of the box it looks healthy but when you end up eating 100 grams rather than 35 it can end up being still quite unhealthy so and then what you'll also find on food packaging is things like total volume or weight in grams or milliliters the manufacturer's details how you should store that product, any allergies you need to be aware of, and a date by when it should be consumed. Um, and with the labels, just be aware as um, there is a bit of trickery. Um, you know, it's essentially, it's a legal loophole. Um, and if you look at the first point there, anything that's named as light, low, reduced, or high, there are no specific guidelines for these terms, but they should not mislead. So I believe there has been examples where, you know, if you have a product that's quite dark in colour and then you make it a little bit lighter in colour, you could potentially call that product light. 
And again, health conscious consumers looking at that will think light means lower in calories or lower in fat or lower in carbs or something like that. And it can be a way to kind of attract people to those foods. However, if a food package uses the words reduced or low fat, it must be at least 25% lower in fat than what it was originally. Uh, the problem with that is if they do reduce the fat, they will often then replace the fat with sugars to um, make it taste nicer. So quite often if you start eating reduced or low fat yogurts and things like that, they reduce the fat, but they increase it with sugars as well. Vice versa, you can also get low sugar products where they will often replace the sugar with vegetable fat. So go figure. Uh, low calorie, this must have fewer calories than the original, but there is no set level. And then sugar free, so that's just say that sugar has not been added, but more often than not, they might have added artificial sweeteners or they may have added um, a vegetable oil or something like that. And once we know all this, and hopefully we're ready to give our clients some advice, we may ask them to do a diet diary. So um, a diet diary is where someone fills in a diary to tell, so they can tell you what they eat on a daily basis. Um, what's good about a diet diary is they're useful for monitoring a client's diet, di uh, dietary intake. They're normally done over three to seven days, so you can get a good insight. Um, if you can do seven days, that's best, because quite often people would eat well, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, but come the weekend, they may not. So if you can gather that over seven days rather than three, you're gonna get a better indication of what they eat. Um, if the client can't really commit to that, because it is quite difficult to do a three day diet diary or seven day, you could do what they call a 24 hour recall, which is where you ask them what they've eaten in the past 24 hours. However, it's not the most accurate because you know if you ask me now, I can't remember exactly what I ate yesterday in terms of what amounts, you know, how it was cooked and stuff like that. So generally a diet diary is more accurate. Um, a benefit of any diet diary is it does get the client, client to think about their diet again. It promotes and refocuses their attitude towards their food. And it means that the information gathered can be used by yourself to give them bespoke personal advice. And obviously nowadays you can use apps and smartphones to make it a lot easier to actually analyze that as well. Potential downside to diet diaries is your client may find it hard to record all that information. I'm afraid your clients may lie, whether they know it or not. They might not realize how much they're eating or they might be measuring things incorrectly or they may just be lying. Um, they may just eat well for the three to seven days that you've asked them to because they're, they're filling out the diet diary for you. So they eat well and then they go back to other habits afterwards. And the potential consideration is that if they do fill out this diet diary, you've got them to analyze it and that can take time. So make sure that whichever method that you use is quite quick and slick. So you're not burdening yourself with too much admin as well. And then just some other ideas to support diet diaries, um, try and use shopping lists. So try and advise them or get them to write what they're going to buy before they go shopping. And then you can look at that and try and advise them on what to buy and what not to buy. So hopefully, you're nipping the problem in the bud before they've even bought it. And again, try and educate clients on amounts and how they can measure food quickly. So actually I know going around to the house, measuring some rice in a jug, saying every time you have a portion of rice, use this cup and you know that that's a portion for you, then that might break down a barrier, which they think, oh, I can't be bothered weighing my food, but they don't need to weigh every time. They just need to weigh it once, figure out how much that is using a, a receptacle that they've got in their house and hopefully that's a quick measure for them. And if you're interested, you can go to our website, CMS Fitness Courses, and under the diet and nutrition section, you can download a diet diary. Um, obviously, and use that as a template, or feel free to use it full stop. And then the last little bit we're looking at is just the digestive system. So um, as we eat food, we need to break it down, and we have specific enzymes that we do to, to or use to do this. So if we eat a carbohydrate, we will break that food into a glucose. That is the end product. You know, no matter what food that you eat as a carb, our body will break it down into a glucose in our body and then use it. If we eat a protein, whether it's fish, chicken, eggs, our body will break it down into an amino acid. And if we are eating fat, it will break it down into a free fatty acid. And we need enzymes to do this. So in our mouth, we have um, a salivary amylase that will break down carbohydrates 
in our stomach we have pepsin which breaks down protein but if you also look a little bit lower there's another enzyme called trypsin that will break down protein as well so you've got amylase for carbohydrates which is in your saliva and you've then got pepsin and trypsin which will break down protein and then you've got lipase that will break down your fats a method that you might use to remember that is that um, a lipase will break down a lipid so a lipid is another name for a fat so a lipase will break down a lipid and a pep the p will break down the protein um, and same for the trips in the p um, and that's essentially how we start to as well as chewing the food and some of the acid in our stomach these are the enzymes that we use to try and specifically break down these molecules okay um, hopefully that's a decent recap of the level three award in prescribing nutrition for physical activity i hope it's been useful um, any questions please feel free to contact myself or contact your tutor okay thank you